Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire supported by Glendivit Books. Once again, today we focus on the COVID situation in Kerala. Cases are rising in that state, although in the rest of the country, they are clearly and fairly sharply falling. So does Kerala have a problem or is the situation in Kerala misunderstood? That's the key issue I shall discuss today with a member of the National IMA Task Force on Coronavirus, Dr. Rajiv Jayadevan. Dr. Jayadevan, as I said in the introduction, I want to concentrate entirely on the COVID situation in Kerala. The seven-day average of daily cases on the 31st of August was 29,321. That's a 60% increase over exactly a week ago. Perhaps equally importantly, on perhaps every single day of the week, Kerala has thrown up 50%, 60%, sometimes even 70% of the total daily national tally. And yet the Kerala population is only 2 or 3% of India's population. So why are there so many COVID cases in Kerala? Yes, all of these statistics are absolutely true. And uh, the question is, why are there so many cases in Kerala? And uh, to answer that, we need to look at a few factors uh, that are driving uh, this phenomenon. A, the first factor is the number of people whom, who have not encountered this virus before is statistically higher than the average in the country. And we know that from the ICMR zero surveys that have consistently shown uh, that the Kerala uh, exposure to the virus has been below the average, which means on average, the, the proportion of people, I repeat, the proportion of people who are, um, let's say, susceptible to this virus is higher than the rest of the nation. I'm talking about average. So the second uh, reason is the, um, uh, the density of the population, because Kerala is, a, is a, uh, unlike many other states that have uh, really clear demarcation between um, villages and towns and cities and so on. Uh, Kerala is pretty much one large metropolis, if you want to call it that way. So I'll, uh, for our viewers, I'll illustrate this with an example. So let's say, let's flash back to 2020. And uh, let's imagine the pandemic is on its way to India. So pandemic comes and let's just imagine uh, for our viewers, let's compare pandemic to Godzilla. Godzilla is a big Japanese monster that walks with heavy footsteps. So Godzilla comes to India and takes a look, who can I, who can I attack? And he finds a large number of people who've never seen this monster before. So um, all over India, um, Godzilla causes havoc. And some areas are shielding better than others. For instance, Kerala uh, knew that the pandemic was coming long before it arrived. And so people were um, being a very literate population. And because many of us doctors were constantly on television, radio, every conceivable medium, even before it came, and because the population had been exposed to Nipah virus, to lethal virus, unlike the COVID-19. So uh, people were shielding. So when Godzilla came, people were shielding in Kerala. As a result, uh, more people outside of Kerala got infected than inside Kerala. There, there were a few cases here as well, but it, the health system barely broke a sweat. Now let's switch to 2021. Let's go to the Hollywood sequel, Godzilla 2. Godzilla 2 is bigger, meaner, and a thousand times larger than Godzilla 1. When Godzilla 2 comes into India, Godzilla 2 takes one look at India and says, well, you know, there are just very few people who have not seen me before. Let me take care of them first. So Godzilla 2 attacks all the uh, vulnerable or susceptible people. Can I stop you? When you can I stop you? When you're talking of Godzilla 2, do you mean the Delta variant? Delta, yes. Godzilla 2 is Delta. Delta is a thousand times bigger than the uh, Delta 1 or, or, or the original variant. So comes to Kerala and finds, hey, here's a land where nobody has seen me before. So let me let me let me go through this area um, in in greater detail. So in one sense, that is really what's happening uh, as a prolonged surge uh, in Kerala from May onwards. We've been as doctors, we've been tracking this. So can um, I interrupt again? Right through. What, can I interrupt again? What you're saying is there are three reasons why. Cases are rising fairly sharply in Kerala today, whereas in the rest of the country, they are not. The first reason is that during the first wave, 
Canada protected its people. Its seropositivity was very low. It was only 44%. The rest of India was 68%. That's a sign that Canada protected its people. Therefore, the number of people who haven't been exposed is much greater in Canada than the rest of the country. Therefore, now, in a sense, Kerala is catching up with the rest of the country. The second reason you see the density of population, Kerala unlike the rest of the country, it's almost one large metropolis, as you put it. It's almost entirely urban or semi-urban, which is why when the virus spreads, it spreads faster and more people. And the third reason you're saying is that when the Delta variant came, it found a population that was vulnerable in much larger numbers in Kerala. And for these three reasons, Kerala is now showing a large number of cases every day, whereas the rest of India is not. Is that an adequate summary of your answer? It is, and uh, it will it will be complete if I if you allow me to add a couple of examples in comparison. Quickly, let's just look at Sri Lanka. Yeah, Sri Lanka, for example, shielded you know better than most parts of the world in 2020 with military precision, pun intended, and um, uh, their case exposure was so low at in January, their zero prevalence was 24%. Even better was Vietnam, which shielded so well, their zero prevalence was 0.4% in January, after a year of the pandemic. Now, both these countries are having a massive surge with the Delta variant. In other words, what is Back happening here. in Kerala is also happening in Sri Lanka, it's also happening in Vietnam, and the reason is the same. These are three populations that sheltered their people from the first wave so effectively that seropositivity was very low. Now, when Delta is more infectious, it's actually attacking them because the number of vulnerable people is greater. Okay, I understand that. But let me in response put this to you. What's particularly worrying about Kerala is that every single one of its 14 districts has a seropositivity over 10%. And in six districts, it's actually over 15%. So it's not just in specific local regions or districts that the positivity is high. It's right across the state. From the length and breadth of Kerala, you have the same very worryingly high positivity rate. That is very true because the Delta variant is so um, easily transmitted. Uh, it, uh, it reaches homes quickly. And uh, once it reaches a home, a household of five people, it affects everyone. And so you multiply, by, by, multiply that by the households in Kerala, it reaches even the remotest parts of, of Kerala. And there are some districts that are less densely populated. For example, Wayanad, beautiful hilly district, and the same with Idiki district, where you get all the spices coming out of Kerala. Beautiful hilly area, but again, a lower population density, but the virus has reached there. And um, uh, that is really ha what is happening here. So you're saying that the high population density of Kerala is the explanation for the fact that, in fact, you have a very high positivity rate right through the state. It's not, it's not to do with the fact that Kerala is being careless and is not containing people properly, is not checking into tra contact tracing properly. It is really explained by the high density. Have I understood that correctly? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Then let me put this to you. The center takes a very different view to both the Kerala government and to the view you've given me yourself just now. As far as the Modi government is concerned, Kerala is a cause of concern. Not so long ago, they sent a special team headed by the director of the National Center for Disease Control, Sujit Kumar Singh. Are you saying that the center's interpretation of concern is either exaggerated or doesn't see things in the proper perspective? The, uh, the team of experts led by Dr. Sujit Kumar, in fact, uh, last year I had the privilege of meeting him at our IMA uh, meeting um, at, at Cochin. But, but back to the story of the team coming to, to Kerala, it's, it's, very, uh, it's very impressive and also comforting that uh, the nation is taking a scientific perspective to a part of the nation that is having an unusually large number of cases. So that's very good. And uh, I, I went through the report and uh, whatever they have said, it rings true and scientific to me. The, what they, the observations that they have made, as I understand, are 
the contact tracing. But I'll, I'll come to the observations and I'll come to the observations in a moment's time. Okay. But if the okay. observations are correct, then it follows the center is also correct to be concerned. And that also means that the Kerala government is not doing the right things. But a moment ago, you said something very different. You said that the concern being expressed by the center did not see things in the right perspective. Now, if you agree with Dr. Sujit Singh's report, you are saying the opposite of what you began by saying. That is the, the reason for that is we need to understand that many processes in, in healthcare have multiple factors that coincide. In fact, what I have just explained are just two or three factors that correspond to the uh, spread of the virus in a region. There are multiple other factors. I'm sure we, if we have the time, we can discuss those very interesting factors as well. Now, uh, as far as uh, your recent question about the uh, center's report goes, one of the factors, uh, if, you, if you want to ask me the specifics, then we can but go I'll to I'll come specifics to specifics later. I'll come to specifics okay. later. It's the big, broad question yes. I want you to address. Yes. A moment ago, you said to me that, in fact, the fat cases are rising fairly sharply in Kerala should not be a matter of concern because there is a background which you explained and it's against that background it's happening. As you put it, Kerala is catching up. But when I said to you that the center is deeply concerned, you also agreed with that. So you can't have it both ways that Kerala can be explained. It's not a matter of concern. And yet at the same time, say the center is right to be concerned. This is why I'm confused. Like I'll come to specifics later. Yeah. But which is the position that you hold? Is Kerala a cause of concern or is Kerala misunderstood? Yes, the Kerala is a, uh, all the physicians here, including myself, we are concerned about the situation here. Uh, I'll give you, I'll give, uh, I'll explain what I mean by that. Suppose somebody gets a heart attack and we find that he's not a smoker. The common question is, he's not a smoker. Why did he get a heart attack? Then we explain, look, there are so many factors that contribute to a heart attack. And some of those are unknown factors as well. But there are about six or seven established risk factors. If you put all of them together, the probability of this person having a heart attack is small. Likewise, the Kerala spread can be explained by a multitude of factors, uh, some of which can, uh, uh, can include what the uh, center's report have found as well. So in other words, we, can't, we should not be caught in a situation where we explain, you try to explain everything using one variable. And that's a common fallacy in science when we say, Look, just like the example I said, he doesn't smoke. So why did he get a heart attack? So we should not look at it like that. So um, as far as the spread of the pandemic con is concerned, there are so many factors. For example, um, how effectively does the virus transmit between people? And that, is a that's, that involves a lot of very interesting physics if uh, our viewers are interested to look at that. Now, let's not get See, into I details and lose your viewers. Let me take you yeah. through the four reasons that Dr. Sujit Singh explained to me and put them to you. Because if Dr. Sujit Singh's four reasons are correct, then Kerala is being careless. But if you still believe that Kerala is not being careless, then Dr. Sujit Singh can't be correct. You see, this is why I keep saying we must begin with that central dilemma that you seem to agree with both sides. I'll take you through Dr. Sujit Singh's four points one by one. First of all, he says Kerala is not doing adequate and proper contact tracing. He says the contact tracing ratio in Kerala is 1 is to 1.2 up to 1 is to 1.7. In other words, even at the highest level, for every infected person, Kerala is not even tracing one other full person. And he says Kerala should be tracing 15 people for every infected person. Respond to that first, that Kerala's contact tracing is inadequate and improper. What, uh, what you said is factually correct, because uh, last year, before the pandemic, uh, when the pandemic was relatively new, people were facing this unknown enemy of unknown impact. So everybody, again, uh, tuned with the Nipah virus, recent episode of Nipah virus, everybody was um, uh, cooperating uh, with uh, keeping people indoors, reverse quarantining, contact tracing, and so on, with the limited workforce, you know, any health workforce is limited. So the entire workforce was geared towards contact tracing, testing, finding out where the uh, clusters are and so on. And when you switch to 2021, the focus uh, changed a little bit into vaccination. The same workforce was involved in this extensive vaccination process, which Kerala is in fact is doing quite well in. And the second factor is there was fatigue coming in for two reasons. One, 
the community, the general population found that this monster was not, according to them, I'm talking from the common man standard, was not as lethal as originally was projected to be. So, Some of them asked, where so you're agreeing, you're agreeing with Dr. Sujit Singh that contact tracing is abysmally low. Your explanation is that A, health workers have diverted their attention to vaccination and secondly, fatigue has also set in. But you accept that contact tracing is low. Is that correct? You accept that? That is my understanding. Contact tracing has come down in Kerala. That's my understanding. Yes. It's not just come down. If Dr. Sujit Singh's figures are correct, it's abysmally low. For every infected person, Kerala is not even contact tracing one full other person. So it's very low. Those contact tracing ratios are 1 is to 1.2 up to 1 is to 1.7. You accept that? I see, I see the report. And I, my understanding is that they've studied the area here. They've physically come here, visited multiple districts and talked with the local doctors uh, here who are involved with that and come to that observation. So that observation has to be correct. Okay, that observation has to be correct. That means contact tracing in Kerala is improper and it's inadequate. Let's come to the second point made by Dr. Sujit Singh. He says that Kerala is not properly monitoring people in home isolation. In fact, he says Kerala is not fulfilling the home isolation guidelines laid down by the center. And given that up to 80, maybe even 85% of COVID patients in Kerala are under home isolation, if that home isolation is not properly monitored, it can become a serious problem. So what's your answer? Is Kerala properly monitoring people under home isolation or once again, is it doing it poorly? Well, uh, I'll tell you my understanding about how Kerala is doing in home isolation because we, we deal with that every day as doctors here. Now, uh, Kerala's home uh, sizes and numbers are larger than national average in terms of number of rooms. If you go through the national census, there are more number of uh, rooms. For example, more than two rooms. If you count the number of two room homes, the percentage is more and proportionally more. So without going into detail. So the number of people that can be safely taken care of in a home that has certain uh, prefix criteria are relatively large. Now, there are some people who live in very large homes. We're not talking about that. I'm talking about the average person who lives in a home that is two or three rooms uh, in, in their home. If there are many number of people, they can't isolate. So such individuals need to go outside into an institutional quarantine. So I do not know the percentages of these people who have uh, required institutional quarantine, but I'm aware that they are underutilized. So uh, therefore, I think that's an area there that can be improved upon. But that being said, this Delta variant is so fast spreading that the secondary attack rate, which basically means how efficiently it spreads to other people, is uh, if it's last year, if uh, two people in a home were getting affected, this year, four out of four are getting affected. 100% are getting affected. I, I, I accept the two points you're making. One, that Kerala has perhaps more rooms per home than the average for the rest of the country, and therefore more people can home isolate more easily. Secondly, I accept your point that the Delta secondary strike rate is huge and therefore other people in the home will also get infected. But the point Dr. Sujit Singh is making is a different one. He's not talking about whether there are adequate sized homes to isolate in. And he's not saying that the Delta strike rate or secondary strike rate is such that more people will get infected. He's saying when they're affected and after they're affected, home isolation is not being monitored. He actually said to me, people are wandering around freely in their neighborhood and not being monitored. They are breaking and breaching home isolation. That's what I'm asking you. Is home isolation being monitored? Are people breaching it? Is the government stepping in to ensure they don't? What's the answer to that? I do not know the specifics of that answer because this is something that should really come from people who monitor the government system very closely. But I'm aware that uh, the grassroots level health care workers, because their attention is uh, solely, almost solely focused on the vaccination drive, uh, the, uh, it's conceivable that uh, the amount of scrutiny uh, must have come down. It is conceivable. Okay, here your answer is not definitely that you agree with Dr. Sujit Singh. You agreed with him definitely on Kerala's poor contact tracing. Here you're saying it's conceivable, it's possible. 
that healthcare workers are now focusing on vaccination and therefore they don't have the time, they don't have the personnel to monitor home isolation. You're not saying Dr. Sujit Singh is right. You're not saying he's wrong. You're saying it's possible, it's conceivable, he could be correct. Let's come. It fits nicely. Part. It fits. Let's come to the third point Dr. Sujit Singh made, that COVID-appropriate behavior is not being observed by everyone in the state. And in particular, he says, the statewide relaxation earlier over E, and now most recently over Onam, was silly and avoidable mistakes. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, silly and avoidable are relatively subjective terms. I will tell you what I've observed and from our involvement here, from the uh, scientific organization here. We sent out uh, severe warnings before Onam, um, saying that we, we are starting with a high baseline in the state, and therefore there could be a major surge. So if you, if you will please cut down your social visits, try to celebrate within your own family if possible. And we explained the reasons using the graph from last year when there was a similar surge from August through October. We said, look, you know, this could most likely happen because of multiple factors, the feather, the type of interactions, the, uh, the number of unexposed people and so on. So we said, you know, we can't really afford a multiple of 20,000. Say, for example, if 20,000, you're starting off with 20,000. No, but I'm stopping afford... you again. Let's not get lost yeah. in the detail. You sent out yeah. an advisory saying that people should try and observe Onam at home. Absolutely. In contrast, Absolutely. in contrast, the state government actually relaxed the situation for three days over Onam. Was it a mistake to do so? Did the state government I, make a mistake? I do not believe so. The reason is the government was very strict about banning mass gatherings. Uh, right from the days of lockdown. So there were no mass gatherings of any kind anywhere. Now, if gatherings occurred, it might have occurred outside a store, outside a, a, a shop where people might have been waiting. But there weren't any parties, uh, you know, massive reunions, that sort of thing. But people were allowed to visit their uh, friends and family, if you can call that a gathering. Yes, that is the part we wanted to intervene in. We said, look, just cut back on the gathering, please. That is what we said. Just, just for clarity, are you therefore saying that on this third point, you don't agree with Dr. Sujit Singh, that in fact the government did not make a mistake with its relaxations over Onam and the earlier relaxation over Eid? Is that your position? Yeah, that's my position. I do not believe that any uh, mistakes based on instructions to the public were made at all. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, there was uh, there were some pictures circulated about mass gatherings. I can confirm there are no mass gatherings in Kerala for a very long time. And what about, always what about an associated point made by Dr. Sajid Singh that appropriate COVID behavior in everyday life is not being fully observed in Kerala? Do you agree with that or do you think that is a mistaken impression? No, I have to respectfully disagree with that because I live in this part of the world and have observed the behavior over a year and a half or longer and have not seen better compliance with um, COVID appropriate behavior in any other part of the world. Okay, that's very important. COVID. That's very important. You not only respectfully disagree, but you've gone on to say you have not seen better COVID appropriate Absolutely. behavior in any other part of the world. In other words, Kerala's COVID appropriate behavior is amongst the best in the world. Just to sum up before I go to Dr. Sujit Singh's fourth point, on the first, you agreed with him, Kerala's contact tracing is poor. You even accepted the contact tracing ratios that he's come up with. On the second, that home isolation is not being properly monitored. You neither agreed nor disagreed. You said it's conceivable, it's possible, he could be correct. But you weren't saying, yes, he is correct, nor were you saying, no, he's not. On the third point, both about relaxations over Eid and Oman, Onam, as well as COVID appropriate behavior, you disagree with him on both of those. Let's then come to his fourth point. His fourth point is that healthcare facilities in northern districts, particularly Malapuram, are under stress. And he said to me that he's specifically talking about ventilator facilities and ICU facilities. And his fear was that if cases keep increasing, then these two facilities in particular could get exhausted. Now you're a doctor, you're the deputy medical director of Sunrise Hospitals. So you will understand the stress on 
healthcare facilities in northern districts. Is Dr. Sujit Singh right? Or once again, do you disagree with him? If you take the state average, definitely uh, that is a wrong statement because I can confirm that over the past four weeks, there has not been a strain in the, sta in the state's healthcare system, particularly with the oxygen beds, critical care beds and ventilators. So it's been a, a just running at a steady state. Now, if you, if you see, uh, a, a whole, uh, if you look across a region, uh, healthcare is not uniform in different parts of the region. Some areas are underserved, some areas are overserved. So some, say, for example, there's a town with three very large hospitals within one kilometer to each other, very large hospitals. And then there are some stretches of land where uh, people have to travel quite a bit. And then the home, uh, the number of people per home also is not the same. Some, some areas have five members per home. Some people have three members per home. Family size also, mat also matters. So I, I would like, uh, I'd like to point out there are some, uh, there will be regional differences. But if you look across the board, there is no increase in uh, ICU or ventilator use. But if you if say, for example, if I, I'll give you an example. So you, we talked about the hospital. No, no, don't give me an example. Answer yeah. specifically about the northern districts, which is what Dr. Sujit Singh spoke yes. about. Yeah. Not state there were wise, observations. But yeah. in the north alone, is there stress no. on healthcare facilities in the northern districts? Yes, there was a stress on healthcare facilities, but uh, there are no alarm signals as of today morning from any of these areas. Now, that's very important. There was, and you said that in the past tense, there was stress on healthcare facilities in the northern districts, but as of this morning, there is no alarm signals ringing. Secondly, statewide, there is no stress on the healthcare facilities, and that means that if healthcare facilities in the north come close to being fully utilized, people can easily be moved to healthcare facilities in the center and the south. After all, even in major Western countries, I'm citing Britain, which I know well as an example, when hospitals in Birmingham or parts of Lancashire are stressed, you sensibly move patients to other hospitals where the stress is less. That happens all over the world. And you're saying the same thing can comfortably happen in Kerala. So once again, I assume that broadly speaking, you are not in agreement with Dr. Surjit Singh's concern about healthcare facilities. Am I right? Uh, for, the for the region, no. But in certain focal areas, like, you know, like, like I said, some areas are relatively less served. Yes, those areas may come under, under some strain. Yes. But people in those areas can be moved to other areas reasonably yes. easily. Yes, they can be absolutely, moved. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Let me add a point of clarification here. One of our aims over the last, say, more than six months is to empower the smaller establishment. See, everyone who's sick doesn't have to go to the Apex Center. And that's a common mistake I've heard discussed in uh, various forums. Uh, COVID-19 can be effectively tackled. The vast majority can be effectively tackled in a small healthcare facility with even one or two beds. And that is an area that we have really, really, really hammered down right through to the grassroots level. So we have created a system. Are you also knowledge. saying, and are you also saying that Dr. Sujit Singh hasn't given Kerala due credit for this? You are empowering small healthcare facilities so people don't have to go to apex centers. And are you suggesting that this is something Dr. Sujit Singh may have overlooked when he spoke about the stress on healthcare in the northern district? Is that your suggestion? Yeah, I do not know if they have looked at all the different treatment facilities. If they have only looked at the apex centers, yes, this bias might come in. Okay. And I presume he would have concentrated on apex centers because he said to me that he was talking specifically about ICU and ventilator. And those would, I presume, only exist in apex centers, not in small healthcare facilities. So to sum up, before I go further, on the four points that Dr. Sujit Singh made, you agreed almost unreservedly on the first, that contact tracing is not done properly. You simply don't know whether he's right or wrong on the second, which is the monitoring of home care and home isolation. On the third, about ONAM and ETH relaxations being a mistake or about COVID appropriate behavior not being observed, you completely but respectfully disagree with him, but you do completely disagree. And on the fourth, which is on the state of healthcare facilities, you're saying quite clearly that at a statewide level, Kerala healthcare facilities are not under stress. They are coping perfectly. In the north, there was some moment of stress, but as of today, there are no alarm sig signals ringing. 
and you are not aware whether he's taken into account the fact that Kerala has laid a lot of stress on small healthcare facilities so people don't have to go to Apex once. That may be something he overlooked entirely. Now, let me put this to you. Shortly before I interviewed Dr. Sujit Singh, and he explained after his return to Kerala his four points of concern. Shortly before that, I interviewed Professor Gagandeep Kang. And she said to me, almost the exact opposite of Dr. Sujit Singh. She said Kerala had done an outstanding job controlling the spread of COVID, which is why the seropositivity was something like 24% less than the rest of India. She also said that Kerala was a role model for the rest of the country. And she wasn't simply talking there about low seropositivity. She was also talking about the very high vaccination, the very high and well-targeted testing, and the very low case fatality. And she was talking about the fact that this shows that Kerala's health system has held up and handled the problem well. Now, there you have two completely polar opposite views. One person saying Kerala is a role model, the other saying Kerala's response is inadequate and improper. Now, you're a doctor. As I said, your deputy medical director of Sunrise Hospitals, which of the two opinions do you agree with? Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, I would go with Dr. Kung's model because of, um, of what she has observed. She has also stated that it's important to be transparent about numbers and to report everything correctly. And um, I believe that she has also said that it's improper to, um, uh, to de uh, disincentivize honest reporting. And this, in fact, this may uh, turn out to be a complication in the long run if we focus on uh, areas that are reporting numbers correctly and then uh, penalize them for, or at least apparently penalize them for um, increased reporting can, can numbers. I interrupt? If you say you go with Dr. Kang, does that mean you believe Canada is a role model for other states? Yeah, I think I don't believe in, um, in uh, uh, what's called adjectives. I will say the model. That uh, forgive me, that here. wasn't an adjective. Yeah. That was a description. It no, wasn't an adjective, it was a, a description. She said it's a role model because she believes Kerala has handled COVID very well. Do you believe yeah. Kerala has handled COVID well? You say you agree with her. Therefore, you mm -hmm. have to agree with I her would, conclusion. I would not use a word role model because I simply don't believe in such words in science. That, that's her opinion. But I will say the, the processes that have occurred here over the past year and nine months have, for the most part, been, uh, been scientific and the results are short. So I believe that. When you say for the most part, the processes in Kerala over the last nine months have been scientific, are you saying Kerala has done the right thing at the right time? Mostly, yeah, mostly. We've, we've agreed with that. There are some disagreements uh, among the scientific community about specifics. When you go into specifics, I'm sure you will find disagreements. But there are some things that should not have been done. For example, uh, if you look at the type of um, restrictions that were made, uh, we don't. Uh, many doctors do not believe that they were very scientific. For example, uh, the idea of the night curfew, the nighttime curfew. What that's interesting. That? The, yeah, that's interesting. Now, your disagreement with the government is not in terms of its laxity or alleged irresponsibility or its failure to do the right thing. Now your disagreement is in terms of the fact that they have imposed restrictions which may not be scientific and justifiable. In other words, they've erred in terms of trying to do too much. And in doing too much, they've done too much of the wrong thing. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting way of looking at it. Yes, I like that. Then let me because we're coming to the end of this interview, put two last questions to you. Kerala has, as you just mentioned, this week imposed a night curfew from 10 p.m. to 6 p.m. There is also a state-wise weekend lockdown. Are those correct measures? Or do you think, given the situation, more is needed? Which of the two? Both are wrong. They should not have been done. Neither the, the night curfew is, nor yeah, the weekend lockdown. Absolutely. absolutely. Both, both are wrong, unscientific. There's no proven benefit for either of those in published evidence, expert opinion, or across the doctor fraternity. So everyone is in disagreement with that that I know of. And I interact with a lot of medical fraternity. I'm coming to the following impression, and I'm pretty sure the audience hearing this interview will agree with me, that other than contact tracing, 
where you agreed with Dr. Sujit Singh that it's being done improperly, not enough people are being contact traced. And the explanation was that the healthcare workers who should do it are now diverted to vaccination and also because fatigue has set in. But other than that one single point about contact tracing, you do believe everything else that's being done in Kerala is correct and proper. I believe that. I believe that. So the truth is, Kerala is doing a pretty good job other than contact tracing. Yes, if you want to summarize everything in one sentence, that would be my sentence as well. And as I said, there's only a limited workforce. If you, if you have a lot of sick people coming to hospitals, would you send your healthcare worker to take care of a sick, sick, a sick worker or would you ask, send them for contact tracing? That is a very good point. If a lot of sick people are coming to hospital, what is it that health workers should focus on and give priority to? Caring for the sick or contact tracing? Which is another explanation Absolutely. for why contact tracing at this point has come down. But the corollary to what you're saying is that if contact tracing is deliberately reduced in importance, then the virus will keep spreading and you're not controlling the source of spread. And isn't that as important as treating the ill? Because if you don't control the source of spread, more and more will fall ill, more and more will go to hospital and the problem will get worse. Isn't that a corollary of what you're saying? Absolutely. I fully agree with you. And I believe that the current strategy is to empower the community, to bring the community back. Remember, the community is fatigued. Many of them have lost their jobs. Many of them are struggling. And we are trying to empower them to come back into helping us with contact tracing. That I understand. But you know what you just said, and you said it, I didn't, suggests that the lapse in terms of contact tracing is actually much more serious than people at first understand. Because it means that you're not stopping the spread. And if you don't stop the spread, you will increase infections. And if infections increase, illnesses will increase and also hospitalization. And so, although it's the only lapse that you agreed with on every other count, you disagreed with Dr. Sujit Singh, but this is one very serious lapse. Shouldn't Kerala actually find a way of improving contact tracing and doing it quickly? Because otherwise the spread of infection will continue. I agree. I believe they're looking at ways, as I mentioned, to recruit people from outside the healthcare fraternity because Kerala has uh, survived all these disasters, including floods and Nipah, using the community. It is not always a designated healthcare worker with a title that yeah. has done the work. So if community can help out, definitely it will improve. How easy will it be for Kerala to get the community to help out? Healthcare workers are in the government's charge. They can be told, instructed and monitored. The community is something the government has to reach out to. It's not always easy and the community may not be willing. So how easy will it be to get effective contact tracing done by the community rather than by healthcare workers? Yeah, I like what you said. You said the community may not be willing and that's a deep statement. And I see that because uh, a community that is fatigued from economic, economic loss, uncertainty from, from um, the, we don't know when the end of the pandemic is, healthcare expenses, um, and uh, uh, restrictions affecting their business. Uh, I do not know how willing they will be uh, to cooperate with such endeavors. I do not know. I simply do not know. And that means that if the community is not willing to cooperate and do the contact tracing that healthcare workers are being diverted away from, perhaps for good reasons, then the spread of infection will continue. And contact tracing... It need not. Before. Yeah, it need not. Because uh, if you see the cycle of coronavirus around the world, it typically lasts for some time and then it just comes down. That is what uh, that is what I was coming to. There are some unknown things about this virus. It just settles down after some time. Absolutely. And when enough people get infected, there will be no further people to infect. And therefore, some level of, in quotations, herd immunity will sit in. But you're suggesting that because contact tracing is being done poorly and because the community may not be willing to step in and do it, actually, the spread of virus you're suggesting will end when Kerala reaches that required level of herd immunity, hopefully, with cases growing at 32,000 a day, which is what the tally was yesterday, we'll reach that level soon. But contact tracing, it remains, and I'm only saying that as we come to the end of this interview, is the one big lacuna as far as the Kerala government is concerned. That is the one thing it has to concentrate on and find an answer to. It's trying to do it by getting the community in in place of health workers, but if the community won't do it, it has to find some other way of doing it. And as yet, 
the Kerala government doesn't have an answer to that problem. That's one area where the Kerala government is falling short. Yes? Would you agree? I agree. My last question. Literally my last. What do you see as the trajectory of COVID in Kerala over the next two weeks or four? Because of good vaccination coverage, the number of people who are falling sick enough to come to hospital is still low. So I expect these, uh, as vaccination coverage improves, also taking into fact the lag of vaccination, you know, vaccination doesn't, coverage doesn't start the day you get vaccinated. But I expect the uh, number of sick people and the number of deaths to eventually drop without going through a, an inferno rather than a slow burn process. At the end of the day, Kerala's very high and admirable level of vaccination will come to its comfort and provide the security it needs. And just for the sake of the audience, I'll point out, 72% of the Kerala population, adult population, has been single vaccinated. 26% of the adult population has been double vaccinated. The nationwide figures are 52% single vaccinated. Kerala is 20% more. 15.7% double vaccinated. Kerala is 11% more. So once again, in terms of vaccination, Kerala is doing an extremely good job. And let's hope that vaccination stops the spread of the virus quickly. Dr. Jayadevan, thank you very much for making time, for answering my questions, and for giving us your perspective on the COVID situation in Kerala. Take care, stay safe. Thank you for having me. Thank you and have a good day.